Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, we're privileged tonight to have John Landry here to talk about the emerging existential threat of AI driven cyber warfare as part of our great presenters series. So thank you, John, for being here. John has been a leader in the software business since the word software was conceived. He's a 40 year veteran, 40 plus year veteran of the industry and has served as the CTO at Software Leaders Lotus, Dun & Bradstreet, Cullinet, and McCormick and & Dodge, as well as the founder, chairman, and CTO of six successful startups. Starting, in, starting 20 years ago, he began investigating investing, sorry, <laughs> investing in software startups and has since invested in over 80 companies and served on the board of directors of over 40. In 2018, the Massachusetts Technology Leadership Council awarded John the organization's highest honor, the Commonwealth Award, for a lifetime of commitment to technology innovation and inclusion. John is currently a lecturer in entrepreneurship and an ex-trustee at his alma mater, the number one ranked entrepreneurship college in the US, Babson College. Thank you again to John for being here. And I have just a couple of Zoom housekeeping notes before we get into the goods. Uh, first, we're recording this session for broadcast, possible broadcast on Wacam, our local cable access station, and for the library's YouTube page. So you'll be able to watch and share this with friends. I'm recording my video, John's video, and his slides. So your face will not be recorded unless you and your, but your voice may be if you speak up. Uh, John will be speaking for about 45 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions. So feel, feel free to put your questions into the Zoom chat at any point and I will read them aloud at the end. Or if you're feeling courageous, you can unmute at that point and ask your question. So now that I've gotten that out of the way, we're ready to get started and I'll hand it over to John. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in my house. <laughs> as I know a lot of you are. Um, I have had the honor of speaking. This is my third time that I've been asked to speak at Great Presenters, which is a, a phenomenal thing that the library does. Um, I had, when I was asked to do it, they were asking about a year in advance. And I picked November at that time because I thought there wasn't a chance that by November that COVID would be an issue. And so you could see my forecasting prowess is, is suspect. Um, uh, I am in my office at, at uh, on Mainstone Farm. I live on the farm. And uh, uh, it's not quite like being there, but at least I'm standing up. So I get to use my hands and that. So uh, I hope this works out uh, for you guys uh, that you can feel uh, participative in it. I'd like to hold the Q&A uh, ideally toward till the end, unless you have a really pressed problem uh, that I've absolutely misrepresented something or something like that. But um, this is a topic that is uh, strangely very similar. Uh, uh, I've been uh, involved in for most of my uh, adult life. Um, uh, you heard part of the, of the bio there, but I've been in software since the word was invented. My father thought I was getting into the lingerie business. He got it confused with underwear at that time. Um, it's been a wild ride. Uh, I've been CTO of 12 companies, meaning the tech lead uh, and product lead on, in all those companies, both big and small. I've been acquired six times. Uh, I'm the board of directors of 40 companies that are software companies, but I've made 80 investments in the software business. I am a geek. Uh, I love it. Um, I'm a news junkie. I'm a guy that's really interested in global politi uh, politics and technology is related to politics. And I look for things that are systems as opposed to just programming. How do you build large scale systems? And what we're going to be talking about today is large scale systems. These systems are fully distributed systems that are called by a whole host of names that we're gonna go through. 
but in some ways, some of the viruses, et cetera, that are attacking are some of the most sophisticated systems that have ever been programmed. And that's what got me interested in this many, many years ago. Um, there weren't a lot of viruses back in the old days when there were mainframes and mini computers. Most of the viruses started to hit when there were networks. And those networks were typically in the early days, local area networks. And there was a vehicle that allowed, the, the network was a vehicle that allowed those viruses, if you will, to spread. And so the first PC viruses were around 1986. And I started wondering about how they worked and all that, and wound up becoming somewhat of a guy that spoke about it. And in 1988, the American Software Association did a report on computer viruses for the software industry, which I did. And from that, I was asked to testify to Congress in 1989 about computer viruses. And that testimony is actually on the internet, which strangely enough, I wound up reading just in preparation for this presentation. Um, and uh, many of the things that we talked about that I talked about then are exactly the same things that I'm gonna be talking about now. Uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same in some ways. So I testified twice to Congress as um, uh, present at hearings for the first one were the people that actually knew something, which was the staff of the congressional uh, 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 subcommittee that was. Uh, and the second presentation was, uh, were the senators. And the two senators that were most involved at that time uh, was Schumer, and Mark. Uh, through that, I got to know those guys somewhat because of this, but indeed, it seems so long ago that I was talking, to computer, talking about computer viruses to the same senators that are in the Senate today. Um, in fact, the leader of the Senate today. So in any case, that um, from a cred standpoint um, is, why I'm talking about it again today. I've had an interest in this from the beginning. I've become somewhat uh, knowledgeable in it, and I want to share some of that knowledge with you, and that's really the objective of what I'm trying to do today. I've lived in Wayland for whatever it's worth for the people that are from Wayland for 40 years. Uh, 40 plus years, as I said, I live on Mainstone Farm, right in the farm, which is just one of the most beautiful places to live in the world. Uh, I've been honored to be a, a Wayland a great presenter. I have one thing that over on the side there you can see, which was a Computer World article that was talking, yes, it's about me, but it's me talking to you about viruses. And this was in the, in the mainframe days. And the point of that, uh, I think I blew it up here. Uh, hold on. Nope, I guess I didn't. Uh, if you could read that. Um, I'm talking, I was at Cullinet at that point, which was the largest database vendor on the planet at that time. And our databases essentially supported all the, uh, the three of the four uh, military forces uh, in the US and also the Strategic Air Command. After I gave a presentation to Congress on that, um, I talked about, I was asked a question, oddly enough by Schumer in this case. And what he asked me was, well, what you talked about uh, about employ disgruntled employees putting what are called worms or viruses into your software. And then what could happen? I said, well, the, the worst thing that could happen is, is that we launched Strategic Air Command, they've gotten the, the instructions wrong because the virus was found in the database or wasn't found, and we wind up bombing Chicago. <laughs> um, that quote got used, as you can see, in Computer World, which was the biggest language, biggest paper that was uh, available at that time for uh, computer people. And John Cullinane, who was my boss, uh, wasn't too happy about the fact that he was featured as being, or that I was being featured as a guy that said Cullinane software could nuke Chicago. So I've learned from that lesson that you don't essentially want to do that. <laughs> uh, but again, it was about computer biases. So let's uh, dig deep into this here. That's, I'm gonna skip over that. Um, cyber hacking, and we're gonna talk about what hacking is, is a phenomenal growth industry. Um, it's attracting a lot of very, very talented people for both good and for bad purposes. But if you look at the, uh, 
at the amount of money that is essentially being lost or spent um, uh, because of cyber attacks. You got you know almost three million dollars lost to cyber crime every minute. You got the cost of a data breach on average being 3.86 million and there's zillions of them. The average cost of downtime is 24 times higher than the cost of a ransomware attacks ransom. So it's not just in some ways you're better off paying the ransom. This is a really controversial topic right now. Malware in 2020 increased by 358% and ransomware increased by 435% from the previous year. And phishing attacks, and I'll define some of this stuff as we go on, uh, account for more than 80% of, of what are security incidents. I'm going to define it right now because it's something that applies to everybody that's here. I had an opportunity yesterday to talk to uh, Tim Henderson, uh, who is on the police of Wayland. And Tim and Tim's father and mother and Timmy and Tommy used to work on the farm here, used to essentially be farm managers. And Tim is now a policeman in the town of Wayland. And I started talking to him yesterday about what I was going to talk about. He says, well, you wouldn't believe the number of calls we get at the police department about phishing attacks. What about to email that says, oh, you won a, a prize or uh, something that says you're going, you're going to, you're hacked. You're, we're going to encrypt if you don't pay money over Bitcoin, a pure ransomware attack. Most of them are false, by the way. Um, and here we are in the town of Wayland and it's getting hit by the police are getting hit by the same questions that we're talking about today. So phishing attacks are attempts usually via email for you to click on something. And if that, if it is a true phishing attack, that particular click is going to install a program in your computer, which could be ransomware could be a silent virus that just sits there until it wakes up on some trigger, could be a worm that all of a sudden transmits itself across a local area network if it's you're in your business. So the, the fact of the matter is, is that you don't want to click on anything if you don't know where it's coming from. And this is by far, when we're talking about these phenomenal of the size attacks, they start because someone clicked on something and that could infect your whole company it could infect the world because of the way these viruses spread so be very careful i'm going to talk about things that you can do uh, to prevent this type of stuff from happening but in particular if phishing attacks account for more than 80 percent of reported security incidents pay attention to what you're clicking on but at the end of the day it's not even about the money it's really about this. Um, this is what <laughs> Crimes America worries about. The two top ones are, are credit card hacking and computer hacking by far. Okay? This is not just something that we quantify as to how much money is being lost, it's how much psychological terror you're being put by being worried about these things that are happening and they are happening. We've got to get to a point of getting a stop to these, but compared to all the other things that you might have answered, it came as a surprise to me that these would be the two top, two top items. You might have heard talk about uh, when he was trying to deny that Russia was responsible for the hacking of the uh, and especially the actors on Facebook, et cetera, on the social networks. He said, well, it could have been anybody. It could have been Russia, but it could have been a 400 pound hacker sitting in his bed. Um, that's what we have here. Hackers have a whole history. Hackers historically have been not pretty geeky people who hung around typically together, um, not very social, and very much into just working with their machines and looking for praise from their fellow hackers as their reward for doing something interesting. 
That was the old way of thinking about them. Um, the new way of thinking about them is a lot different. The definition from the dictionaries of what a, packer, a hacker is. And in all three, they have some kind of bias towards these people that say, oh, these are people who have unauthorized access to data, who have illegally gained access, who have illegally obtained uh, access. So hackers had a very negative connotation. The word is pretty well charged. Um, I'm getting an entered in the waiting room, Courtney. <laughs> do I do that or do you? I guess I'll admit. Okay. Got it. I got it. <laughs> um, right. Uh, what now? It's 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 changed, um, and the reason is is because of the cyber attacks. <laughs> a hacker knows a lot about the weaknesses that are in systems because historically that's what they would exploit. Uh, as time has progressed, indeed what has happened is, is that they've divided into two camps, the black hat hacker and the white hat hacker. The white hat hacker does good, the black hat hacker does bad. And those two camps, both of them are being paid a boatload of money to come join companies, governments, law enforcement. It is very hard not to get a job if you're an expert, an expert, not even, a hacker in cybersecurity. It is in such demand that these people are being paid a ton. And you can see by for who, software providers. Most of the hacks that are really, really problematic are done on the operating systems. The operating systems are Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android, Linux. Those systems, if they get attacked, everybody's running them. So by definition, if they get attacked and something happens to them, everybody's going to have the problem. And those are the most dangerous of all the cyber attacks that can happen. So those companies are willing to pay a lot of money for experts in cybersecurity, AKA hackers, the network vendors, the security vendors themselves. There's security software providers, the antivirus people, essentially like a Symantec or a, um, Kaspersky. Those people wanna be on top of this as much as possible. They're gonna hire those people. Enterprises now under attack. You heard the colonial pipeline story just a few weeks ago that a utility being hit. The banks get hit repeatedly. Uh, railroad shipping, transportation, mining. These companies that have big asset bases that if they get attacked, those asset bases might be uh, in danger. Uh, they will pay a ton. Then there's the cyber criminal gangs. These are gangs, uh, criminals at the end of the day, but they have learned that it's a lot easier to rob a bank from a computer terminal than it is with a gun inside the bank. So, and the rewards could be a hell of a lot bigger too. So now there is a big effort by criminal gangs to recruit cyber criminals, i.e. hackers that have gone to the black hat side. Some of those gangs are actually state tolerated like the ones in Russia. They're, they're definitely operating in Russia in the open, but Nobody's coming down on them in Russia. Law enforcement, as I just talked about with the Wayland police. Now, probably our police is our department is not going to hire a cyber criminal expert here, but perhaps at the state level, for sure they are. And certainly at the FBI level and the CM, those types of law enforcement agencies are gonna be after them. And then you've got the military. We have the US Cyber Command under General Nakasani. Uh, he is in charge of cyber defense and offense. He needs the hackers to figure to be his soldiers on the ground. This is a big deal. Uh, the corresponding U.S. Cyber Command in, in uh, North Korea is, uh, is uh, Reconnaissance General Bureau Number 121. 
the Internet Research Agency in Russia, the PL unit uh, uh, 61398 in China. Those are the equivalent cyber commands in those countries, and they are looking worldwide for top talent. And finally, you've got the government security agencies, the, the spies, if you will, CIA, CIA, I threw IRS in there, not, they're not really spies, we're in DHS, but the GRU. And then finally, the NSA, the National Security Agency, the most secret of the agencies that work in the US government. We're gonna come back to the NSA in a moment. But bottom line is, if you want to get a job or you want your kids or grandkids to get a job, have them learn cybersecurity. That is the hottest, hottest by far for a long time it will be a job opportunity that exists in the world today. So not only is there critical demand for the hackers, there's also critical demand for their exploits. Now, we're going to come to a little terminology uh, lesson in a minute, but the term zero day exploits is something that means there's a way of getting into a system via a back door. Um, a zero day exploit means, or for example, you need, if you're going to hack a system, you've got to get into the system somehow. So typically that's through a program. Well, how do you get the program there? Well, you're gonna get the program there by a phishing attack. Uh, there's uh, certainly other ways, but that is the, the predominant way right now uh, of getting a program into a system that you can subsequently use for nefarious purposes. Um, the operating system vendors like Microsoft and, and Apple are all over this trying to keep up with what are uh, potential holes in their systems that can be exploited by hackers. And so a hacker, an, a hacker's exploit implies that it is something that is a hole in the system, but it might've been a hole in the system that was fixed. So it's already been fixed. That isn't a zero day exploit. A zero day exploit means that the hole is still there and they, there is nobody fixing it at that point. And that means in zero days, it's still there. Um, those exploits are found by hackers. And instead of them just being an employee of some other company, they could be an independent and try to sell their exploit to someone else, like all those people that are on the left side, as something that they can have that the other people don't have, if you pay me enough money for doing it. So the result of that is, is that there is now a marketplace for exploits, for holes in systems that can be exploited if you want to pay for that. And that marketplace is a very odd marketplace because the person who has the exploit doesn't want to share it with someone else. And the person who might want the exploit wants to know that it will actually work. So it becomes a very difficult market to get the buyers and sellers aligned because they're both fearful of the other person taking them to the cleaners. And of course, these people are not necessarily uh, the highest uh, caliber of, uh, of ethics uh, in the world. So the bottom line that, that happens there is most of this is done at, at least historically, was done at conferences, the hacker conferences, where the people, the buyers and the sellers could meet and potentially go to a hotel room and uh, see the thing in action and decide, okay, I'm gonna buy that and here's the price. And those people would essentially agree. And now that exploit has been potentially accessed by a security agency, by a cyber criminal gang, or by a software provider that is trying to protect their own software. So this marketplace of exploits is a relatively new phenomena and a very scary one. But it also, again, shows the power that the hackers have, that if they can discover these exploits, then they can make a heck of a lot of money. The Lamborghini that you see down at the bottom is from Moscow's uh, Maxim Yakubets, who is the founder of Evil Corp. <laughs> This is in Moscow, and he is 
a notorious hacker. Evil Corp does not have an office. They work out of uh, changing coffee shops through Moscow every day, uh, but manage to use the computer to turn them into a hole. Evil Corp is after the banks. Uh, he's made a zillion dollars robbing banks uh, with the tacit approval of Putin. Okay, but the U.S. now has come down pretty hard on him. He's just been, he's been indicted in the U.S. now, so that means he can't tra travel here. But he's potentially not going to be able to travel anywhere outside of Moscow now, uh, which is a new, new thing to happen. For the most part, historically, uh, in the last few years, these people have been somewhat immune from prosecution, uh, immune from being uh, hacked against. Uh, that's changing. We'll talk about that in a second. But part of his calling card is all of his people have Lamborghinis. <laughs> so again, you get paid top dollar for this type of work. Uh, now, I mentioned the NSA. Now, that's, that's the building. They're in charge of cybersecurity for the United States. But you, remember, you may remember the NSA got in a lot of hot water uh, a while back. Um, essentially what happened, first of all, what does the NSA do? The NSA's mission is protection and formulation of code ciphers and cryptology for the military and other government agencies, as well as the interception analysis and solution of coded transmissions. These were, the NSA is the result of uh, the same agencies that essentially did all the Enigma code breaking, the Japanese code code breaking in World War II, um, those were that group of people were in charge of what was called signals. Signals being the transmissions that were taking place between um, uh, in the military that is you know between the uh, between the the generals etc. Um, and were able to crack that. What the NSA is is its function is to work off of communications. So that was what it was limited to. And it had to be communications in uh, foreign lands or between US people and foreign people. It couldn't be communications that was only in the United, uh, Amer among Americans. Um, the general, uh, it had to be a, a general or an admiral that was in charge of the NSA, a minimum of three stars, that's Nakasone. He's in charge of the MS NSA, but he's also in charge of Cyber Command, uh, that part of the armed forces that is essentially dedicated to uh, cyber, cyber warfare. So it's interesting that those two are in the, that he is in charge of both of those. That's some, there's some um, um, uh, modification possibly uh, forthcoming. But right now, Nakasone runs both of them. And in some ways, you get, you get what it means. It means that he's going to get the information from the NSA that he needs. And then a lot of that information is going to be electronic communications between computers. And then he runs Cyber Command, which can then take action, uh, either defensively or offensively, uh, based upon what they find there. It's, the NSA is an incredibly powerful agency because it's actually part of the Department of Defense. Um, uh, it, it is not subject, therefore, to congressional review. It essentially operates on its own under the DOD. And the result of that is, is no congressional review means it's got fairly wide latitude as to what can it do, it, what it can do without getting caught, if you will. It's bigger than the CIA. Most people don't realize that it is a very large agency, and it has enormous uh, computer power uh, at its disposal because it tracks communications. And with electronic communications, you know how much there is. Think about how much communications is going on. So what happened is, oh, I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna go by this, sorry. Um, is that, um, the NSA got in hot water because of this guy. This is Edward Snowden. Um, I'm sure you've heard his name before. Uh, it's a mixed bag. Some people think he's a absolute criminal. He's a traitor. And other people think he's a hero in some ways. Uh, 
I'm going to tell you why they think that particular way. Uh, Snowden worked at uh, the NSA. He was a contractor uh, for Booz Allen Hamilton, a consulting firm that does a lot of work with the government. Uh, he had previous gigs with, the, with Dell and the CIA. When he got to the NSA, he became disillusioned with the programs he was working on. He voiced his concerns about it. He was ignored, so he got PO'd. He decides this is really important, what I'm trying to find, what I'm finding here, and decides I'm going to probably have to leave my job. He leaves his job, flies to Hong Kong from Hawaii, where he was working for the NSA branch, if you will, there. And a month later, reveals thousands and thousands of classified NSA documents to Glenn Greenwald and a number of other journalists that ranged from just about everything. They were documents of, of email, but they were also a lot of information that was security-based information. On June 21st, 2013, just coincidentally his 30th birthday, the D Department of Ju Justice unseals uh, charges against him for violating the Espionage Act and theft of government prop property and revokes his passport. He decides, I'm going to go to Moscow. He, was he had to live in the airport terminal for a month. Uh, finally, Moscow said, OK, I'm going to give you a right of asylum. He had multiple ones of those. And then subsequently, he became he was allowed to be a permanent resident of, uh, of Russia, uh, where he lives today. Now, you might wonder, why am I, you know, talking to you about this? <laughs> Uh, because of this, uh, what Snowden released, everybody that was focused on Snowden at the time, and really to, to this time, was focused on the documents that were dumped, that were about intercepting phone calls of millions and millions of Americans, and the intercepting of those calls was only the metadata, the, the time of the call, the number called, the number called from, but none of the content of the call. And despite there wasn't a lot of information there, there was enough information that people thought their privacy had been violated by an organization that was not supposed to cross into the foreign realm. I'm sorry, not, not the domestic realm. And yet it seemed like they had everybody's phone calls because how would they know which phone calls were going to other places without getting all the phone calls? <laughs> so what happened is, is the press and Congress focused on that, but for me, what was far more interesting was the cyber revelations that transpired or were leaked. The first one was that the MSA had a myriad of ways around encryption. So for the longest time, it was believed that encrypted communications uh, was safe and secure. But as it turns out, the NSA could crack just about anything and all that information uh, that people had saved, et cetera, uh, was now uh, uh, available to be cracked. You can't see it. <laughs> it's my wife. Who's, no, I mean, so right. <laughs> um, so, sorry about that. Um, now, um, so, one, everybody stored data that they thought was encrypted and therefore safe. All of a sudden, the NSA could have access to. How could they have access to it? Well, they had secretly developed their own and many of them zero day hacks, which gave the NSA exclusive backdoor access to widely used operating systems, social media platforms, and smartphones, meaning the NSA had written code, taxpayer money that allowed them to get into not communications traffic, but in fact, systems, okay, the endpoints. Um, zero day, just to be clear here, as it says, is a flaw to piece of hardware and software that when exploited allows undetected access. You don't know that somebody's gotten into your system. That's what makes them really valuable. Um, the flaw has not been reported or made public to the responsible company. So if Microsoft has a flaw in their OS 
and the NSA discovers it, what do you think the proper way of handling that is? Okay, would given that that flaw is potentially going to allow a whole host of other parties to potentially get into that particular part of the system and then go from there to put malware in or whatever, my gut would tell me, well, that would be something that the NSA would want to have patch, Microsoft patch, so that it wouldn't be there. But the NSA had a very different view of it, which is, this is a path I have to get into other people's systems. And given that Windows and Mac OS, et cetera, are worldwide used by friend and foe alike, I'd like to have a back door to get into those systems to see what they're doing. Um, and so they decided that they weren't going to tell the vendors that those holes existed in their systems. And those holes could be exploited by the NSA, but of course they could be exploited by others as well. In fact, in a number of cases, when a particular zero day exploit gets into a system, the first thing it does is look in the system to see if there's any zero day exploits that are put there by others, i.e. the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians. And if there are, it clobbers them. <laughs> but I mean, there's battles that are potentially going on in your machine that you have no idea is, are, is really happening. So they thought that the zero day hiding, having them have exclusive access to these holes was a matter of national security. They didn't want the back doors closed. And so they didn't tell anybody. Nobody knew. Now, not only did the NSA develop its own zero days, but it went to the markets of hackers that essentially have put their exploits on the market, like I talked about earlier, and put them on the gray market. And the NSA with US taxpayer dollars bought exploits that could be used on other systems uh, that would never again be reported to the, the creators or the uh, vendors of those systems. So this was pretty big revelation that the NSA was doing a whole host of things here that are quite controversial. Um, and in fact, what's even more interesting is that they really wrote some damn good routines here, damn good exploits. So good that as we'll see, a number of those exploits have been used by others to create the most disastrous of the cyber attacks that have occurred. So our own government's people created things that are now being used that cause us all the freaking problems that we're having that in, in cyberspace right now. So the response throughout the globe was what? And remember, if Snowden didn't release this, nobody would have known it. And the NSA would have kept on doing this and God knows to what end. But at this point, both friends and foes are reacting incredibly negatively because they have discovered that the NSA is or will be or can be in our systems and we either don't or won't know about it are encrypted secrets that they might have seen in those attacks are probably already revealed because they can break the encryption. Never mind that they're working against their own citizens and companies like Microsoft and Apple, that they can't fix their code, that, that in fact, the NSA knows these holes exist. At best, it's a cyber espionage attack. At worst, it's cyber warfare. And every one of the countries that has the money to do this and some that even don't go, we must run a response now. We've got to have cyber weapons. And where did they go to find the cyber weapons to the same marketplaces and backward engineering or stealing the code in some cases that the NSA created 
to create those back doors. It's a fascinating <laughs> uh, series of events. And so it begins. So given that the NSA was creating all these uh, opportunities, should we say, uh, for exploits, where did they use them? Um, when we're worried about stuff, uh, you know, being attacked, one of the things that I worry about is the utilities. Are we going to go through a, uh, the, the, utility, the nuclear utilities in particular are going to be attacked and God knows what can happen then, a meltdown? Uh, the railroad system is going to be attacked, uh, airlines, all these things that have to do with physical representations as opposed to information technology. So if somebody does a malware attack on, then you're a victim on your PC. That's an IT attack, information technology attack. No physical representation of you or your house or anything like that has been modified. But the opposite of that is called an OT attack. An OT attack is operational technology, the machines, the assets, the physical devices, um, whether it be uh, the plane itself, uh, the manufacturing plant, the oil rig, whatever. Those are physical manifestations. And IT and OT still are digital technologies. But when they get crossed, when those systems start talking to each other, that's where a lot of problems arise. And the first OT attack was a sabotage attack created by who? The NSA. <laughs> Probably with the help of Israel or Israel with the help of the NSA, but the two of them together created the attack that became known as the Stuxnet worm. And that's uh, Abed Didjad, I can never pronounce his name, looking at a series of uh, uh, essentially centrifuges that are used to take uranium-256 and separate it out uh, to get the high, highly enriched uranium, which they needed for the bomb. Now, those centrifuges are controlled, as it turns out, by what's called a SCADA system. A SCADA system is a supervisory control and data acquisition system. It is Siemens, in this case, was the manufacturer of this particular SCADA system. It was the control system that controlled those centrifuges that you see in the picture there. And the centrifuges are creating this uh, highly enriched uranium by spinning at, uh, at uh, 65,000 RPM. Um, and it's a very precise process in order to do that. So what the U.S. decided at some point, the NSA most likely, was that we did not want to necessarily bomb this facility, which is Natanz in the Iranian desert uh, to this day is the place where they make the highly enriched uranium and their nuclear uh, potentially bomb program is headquartered there. But what if we could find a way to get those centrifuges so that uh, they wouldn't work that well? And they decided that they could if they wound up writing some code that would modify the semen system so that it would spin at uh, speeds that were either too fast, too slow, or both without the operators knowing it. It was, again, a masterful piece of software because it allowed the SCADA system to present to the operators exactly what they're used to seeing. In other words, what was being shown was not what was really happening. That's how good the software was. And nobody could tell the difference. And so the result of that was you have to assume that the Iranians knew that their technology for making the centrifuges was not that good. So they were accustomed to having a lot of failures and they just overcame a lot of failures by making more and more centrifuges. But the fact was is what was causing the failures was not their manufacturing lack of prowess, if you will, but in fact, this system, the Stuxnet worm, that essentially was spinning those 
centrifuges up and down so that they go to 90,000 revolutions per minute and then down to five revolutions per minute, which could not be the way that you get the highly enriched uranium out the other end. So this was, a, again, a highly sophisticated piece of software, but the Iranians had kept the, uh, the whole Natanz operation off the internet, off any external network, because they were incredibly fearful of exactly what happened. But somehow, somebody probably got a USB key that had this software inside the plant. And once it was inside the plant, Largely all those control systems were running on IBM PCs, equipment, uh, running that Siemens software. But the result was the Siemens software became a vehicle for transmitting it all through the plant and all of the centrifuges and their controlling systems were infected. The Iranians had no idea for years and years, actually, we think three to five, that this was the problem they were having until um, the uh, the um, uh, papers were released uh, by Snowden. And then they wound up putting two and two together and realized that they had been the subject of a massive cyber attack, a sabotage cyber attack to sabotage what they were trying to do. They immediately guessed that it would be the US and Israel. Uh, and eventually we did admit that that was the case. Uh, but approximately what happened was though is that they made a change to the system we did and that change essentially wound up replicating itself across the planet and in turn all the Siemens SCADA equipment was being infected at companies that had nothing to do with Iran including companies that are in the United States and all of a sudden they were infected by this so this is one of the problems that you have with this type of technology is it spreads very quickly, but how to control it, it is like a virus. It is exactly the parallel, that's why it's called that, uh, that once it spreads, it's very hard to keep it under control. So once again, the US, we were the first to use the atomic bomb and we were the first to use a cyber weapon attacking physical assets now referred to as operating technology attacks. Um, the toothpaste was out of the tube. The NSA creations that were the core of this system became the core of other attack vehicles that were created by others to this day. That's how good the software was. But in fact, once it escaped, it created all kinds of problems. So, I'm not going to uh, go, this is the mechanics, you can read it if we're going to provide the slides. Um, the Iranians got PO'd about this and decided, okay, <laughs> we're probably not going to be able to attack the United States, but um, I bet you we could do something to Saudi Arabia, one of their allies, and kind of screw up uh, Saudi. So the Iranians themselves, using components that were found inside the Stuxnet attack, created again by the NSA, decided they could make an attack. And what they did was the Shamoon virus attack in 2012 and took down and wiped clean the disks of 30,000 Windows computers, uh, sent the files back to Iran that before they did the wipeout. And then, after those files were sent, they had what's called a logic bomb to overwrite the boot sector. I'm not going to get technical with you, but a, a, a logic bomb essentially goes off like a time bomb. And at 11 a.m. August 15th, 2018, boom, it overwrites the boot sector, making all those PCs totally unusable and displays a U.S. flag burning on the screens of what is now a dead computer. Pretty interesting. Iranian, Iranian hacker was suspected. It has a virus bloodline going back to the NSA. Production systems were unaffected. In other words, the oil wells, et cetera, in the chemical plant because they were in an isolated network, but all the PCs that were there doing whatever kind of work, office work, et cetera, uh, were essentially wiped out. Subsequent to that, an almost identical attack in 2016, but this time going after physical gear. 
another system, the Schneider Electric's Triconic Safety Control System, which regulates for a, a petrochemical plant voltage and pressure and temperatures used in 18,000 plants, the Schneider Electric Triconic System was under attack. That attack, they believe, was the New York Times article, all investigators believe the attack was most likely intended to cause an explosion that would have killed people, but it didn't go off. The reason it didn't go off is that the Iranians had a bug in the system <laughs> and the bug resulted in that system not being able to be, to do the explosion. But as it says there, it's probably been fixed. But again, an OT attack, an operational technology attack, this is going back now, 2017, 2016, um, we're seeing that we've already got attacks on now what our operational technology, which is the scariest of all. Subsequent to that, uh, in 2017, we get the WannaCry virus. I'm, WannaCry is a virus created uh, again from the componentry of the NSA. Uh, the NSA had a, uh, an exploit called Eternal Blue that allowed it, a system to essentially gain access to another system and then reproduce throughout the internet, as well as the local area networks that were inside companies. In one day, this is what happened. The virus was launched. It attacked Windows computer by encrypting data and demanding a ransom payment in Bitcoin. That's what the screen looked like. And it says, oh gee, you can recover your files if you just send us money via Bitcoin. Uh, again, this is a state-sponsored ransom attack. It is believed that the North Koreans have raised over $2 billion, uh, uh, you're really a bankrupt country, raised over $2 billion from cyber attacks, typically ransomware. This one didn't work very well for them. What happened was um, uh, Eternal Blue was stolen that particular component wasn't in, for example, the dumps of, of uh, Snowden. It was stolen from the MSA, NSA by a guy that we used to work there, uh, or was working there, and then marketed it through what are called shadow brokers, which is like an e-commerce site for exploits run, run by a Russian gang, as it turns out. Um, so you could buy the componentry for this virus, which apparently uh, North Korea did. Interestingly enough, Microsoft had published a fix for the internal blue vulnerability, the very key item in this virus, just days before, or weeks before for the current uh, update of the OS for Windows, and days before for variants of Windows that were now unsupported, in other words, like Windows 98, Win 98. So, um, what happened was, and I'm not gonna, this gets a little too much detail perhaps, but uh, the point is, one of the reasons it didn't work is because Microsoft had published the update that essentially negated the way that this particular attack worked. But what it required was that people update their systems when new updates are available. In this case, weeks before this attack happened. The companies that and people who did not update their system with the upgrade that was freely available, I presume most of you know how upgrades work, um, were attacked. The ones that did upgrade weren't attacked. Okay, it was negated. So lesson learned for both companies and individuals, you've got to keep your systems up to date because that's where the fixes are as soon as they're found and companies like Microsoft are both trying to create, to find, you know, using hackers to find the holes that are employed by them, as well as buying um, uh, exploits that they can then fix. Once they fix them, you want to get them. And that's the point. You got to do those upgrades. So estimated $4 billion worth of damages really hit the national health system in Britain hard. 70,000 devices, including MRI machines, et cetera, were out of luck uh, because they weren't working anymore because they were attached to Windows computers. Um, a very big virus, again, really using our own stuff that we created 
and uh, and very bad uh, uh, upgrade logic for people or upgrade doing upgrades for the for a huge number of people in the population. It's believed that there's still 10 million systems that WannaCry would still be able to hit. But there was another story, the Marcus, Marcus Hutchins story, and I don't have time to tell you that story, so uh, as to why it didn't work. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you one more um, and then kind of wrap this thing up and we'll take the rest as questions. <clears throat> Excuse me for one minute. Um, one of the worst attacks ever was in December of last year. And it was the Solar Winds attack. Solar Winds was a company that essentially uh, provided software for large for companies to manage their, their networks, internal networks. <clears throat> very successful company, very successful product, over 300,000 users worldwide. Um, was attacked. And the way it was attacked, Again, a lot of attacks are not to, to you know, get credit for. It's to find a way in and then start doing things. And so this was a very different form of attack. Solar Winds is a software company. So what a software company does is go and sends updates out, just like I said, when they have new enhancements for their system or they're doing bug fixes for their system, they put an update out. Well, the Russians decided, huh, I wonder if we could get in and put our malware into their updates. <clears throat> and if we did that, then when they sent their updates out and their customers downloaded it, they'd be downloading our exploit. And once we've got the exploit in this particular exploit, we can do anything. We can change, have the system call back to us, and then we can tell it some new software that we like because we've got a back door into all these systems. So instead of just attacking solar winds, they were attacking the customers of solar winds. And in fact, it worked beautifully. How did they get into solar winds? In order to get, the, to get access to the update system, they went through the standard login procedure and found that there was an update password <laughs> that they could use called SolarWinds123. No you know, two-factor authentication, no other authentication. You could get into the update server with a, with a idiotic password like SolarWinds123. So what happened is the users of SolarWinds wind up downloading and installing this update, unwittingly giving SVR, which is KGB, KGB is SVR is a new name for the KGB, hackers access to their networks. This is called a supply chain attack. It's, it's targeting the trusted supplier to an organization, not the organization itself. In other words, the customer is the trusted supplier. Uh, supplier. So, or I'm sorry, Solar Winds is a trusted supplier of the customer. Look at who it attacked. It got the White House, all five military branches, the State Department, the Treasury Department, Homeland Security, Sandia Labs, which is where the atomic weapons labs are, um, top five accounting firms, Microsoft, FireEye. FireEye is a security company, sorry. Uh, that uses Solar Winds. All of a sudden, the Russians had access to the toolkit that FireEye uses so that people won't get attacked. <laughs> 17,000 customers installed the, installed the software. Bottom line is, it's not known what that, the status of that attack is. In other words, the way that these types of systems work is you don't know <clears throat> whether it's running. It's running. And what it's doing is bringing new stuff down. And so even if you had the key to this particular attack, by the time you negate, negated it, if you will, uh, more software has already come down that you have no idea what it is and God knows what it does. And look at who it affected. So this is really something else. This is cyber espionage. And cyber espionage 
has a really funny place in the hierarchy of things that are bad uh, because it's considered okay to do cyber espionage as opposed to cyber attacks on physical machinery, et cetera. But the response to this is probably going to be somehow the same thing. In other words, Biden admits that they're pretty limited in what they can do here because espionage is considered to be okay. We do it all the time. That's what the NSA is all about. So bottom line is this was a disastrous, a massive failure of enormous proportions. Company's still around, can still buy their products. <laughs> so it's a weird world. All right, I'm gonna just uh, kind of wrap this. There is a pandemic of hacking. Okay, it's everywhere. And these are hacks of large companies, not like people sitting in their libraries. Uh, Marriott uh, used passwords of the, the hack used passwords of two employees that they found or somehow got a hold of, of a franchise of Marriott to exfiltrate the data. Exfiltrate means take it out, right? As opposed to infiltrate, of 5.2 million guests. I'm sure I'm in there, <laughs> maybe you too. Okay, it appears that the Russians again are the ones that have done that. Magellan, uh, healthcare company, health insurance company, uh, I'm sorry, healthcare company, exfiltration of 365,000 patient records. Twitter itself hacked, uh, got employee credentials, wound up through those employee credentials, the hackers wound up uh, putting uh, overtaking the accounts of Bezos and Musk, et cetera, and put a Bitcoin scam out. The hacker that was arrested as the ringleader was 17 years old. Software AG, a German company, a German software company, double extortion attack, first a ransom attack, decided the company decided that they would, despite the fact that the, the hackers said that they will publish confidential data on all their employees that they've obtained, uh, decides that they're not going to pay the, the ransom. Uh, so the hackers decided, okay, we'll publish all the employees, passport numbers, social security, date of birth, all the things that you need. Essentially, that's called a name and shame attack um, a result. Uh, Psychotherapy uh, uh, therapy center in Finland, data breach, 25,000 exfiltrated uh, patient records of people that have psychological problems. Um, instead of attacking the company itself, they got the records and blackmailed the patients because maybe people don't know, want to know that you've got some psychological issues. 2021, the colonial gas attack, which I've been asked about many times, had nothing to do with an OT attack. Nothing was ever touched in terms of the gas pipeline itself. Um, but this was the largest fuel pipeline in the United States, and it was shut down because they didn't know whether or not the physical asset uh, control machines, uh, control uh, computers were attacked. Um, it was the result of one compromised password. So when you look back at this, you go, it's incredible. These are massive, massive, expensive, and problematic attacks. And this is just a small list of them. And, the re and why? Passwords. <laughs> Passwords keep coming up and up and up again. Phishing. Phishing, phishing, phishing. How do you get a password? Phishing. But why aren't more and more companies, and they're starting to, Using two, uh, you know, two-step authentication, multi-step authentication, the type of things that, that some of you, I'm sure, are doing now, where you get a text message sent to your phone um, after you log in, but and then it'll accept you, uh, if, if because it knows that you have been authenticated based upon your telephone. Although that SM, the text message story is a little sketchy right now too. But Apple's done a very, very good job on really leading the field in terms of authentication encryption um, with, you know, whether it was the fingerprint readers originally or whether it's uh, your face geometry, which is the way that essentially it's done today. 
Um, those are ways of authenticating people that can't be cracked easily. A user ID and a password is the easiest thing to crack in the world. You can go buy them. There, there are marketplaces of user IDs and passwords. Okay, sometimes you might get a message I have that says, you know, that password you're using uh, has been used before um, in a in a in a data breach. So you might want to think about it. Yes, passwords are very very important. Okay, so any good news? <laughs> Yes, don't believe everything you hear. The number of actual OT attacks is far fewer than you would believe from listening to the hype that comes from the cybersecurity vendors. Okay, that's a big deal. Um, cybersecurity vendors, if you see, there is a ETF uh, in the stock market called BUG, B-U-G. That bug is a cybersecurity ETF, meaning it's the combination of all these companies that are in the cybersecurity business. It has a chart that looks up and to the right. Um, this is a hot business. So they don't want anybody to hear that maybe these attacks aren't as frequent as we're making people believe. And if we keep on piping the hype, or, you know, pumping the hype machine here, uh, this will be better for our stock price. So there have been up until right now, limited numbers of operational technology attacks, which are the most dangerous. And finally, people are getting hip that you separate your IT and your OT systems. You put a firewall in between them. You do everything possible not to have the OT systems expo exposed to the internet. On top of it, ransomware success has been spotty. That huge, huge uh, attack that I, I talked about uh, earlier, um, the WannaCry only only raised hundred thousand dollars <laughs> before it was essentially shut down. Uh, uh, the exploit markets are starting to be shut down. Governments are starting to either attack them so that they're shut down, or they're shut down because they're found to be in a country that doesn't allow them to be there. Cyber criminals are starting to be arrested. Okay, that's good news. Uh, or at least in the ways that we talked about earlier with the Russians, uh, they better not travel because they might be essentially arrested while they're traveling. Um, Cyber Command is striking back now. Nakasone no longer needs, the general, no longer needs approval to do a counterattack uh, on if, if we have been attacked. Before that, in order to do the counterattack, uh, they had to go through all kinds of bureaucratic steps all the way up to the president. That's now in his, he can make that decision up to a point. Um, so that has put a slowdown in a lot of the state-sponsored attacks because they're afraid now, except North Korea, which doesn't have any infrastructure to attack, uh, to, to, uh, to strike because we might strike back. Uh, just for whatever it's worth during the last election, actually the midterms of the previous election, 2018. Um, we shut down the office that was the cyber command, if you will, of the Russians. Um, and the result of that uh, put a stop in 2018 to a lot of the crap that was going on on Facebook, et cetera, because they realized, ha, huh, the Americans are getting hit. Um, there's enhanced cyber defenses now. A lot of those cyber uh, companies that I referred to in the, with their stocks, they do have great products. Whether they're needed to the degree that there's the number of companies that are needed in order to do this is another story. But as more and more attacks occur, the defenses get better and better. So uh, that's good news. The most simple techniques could have stopped a lot of these. Multi-factor authentication, which I talked about. Non-obvious passwords instead of, you know, uh, solar winds one, two, three. Change them often, uh, get a scheme, use multiple passwords, not the same password everywhere, or use a password manager. Um, passwords are really, really important for everybody if you don't want to get hacked as a company or as an individual. Download updates only from a vendor's authenticated website. No USB keys, no third-party download sites, no email messages, et cetera. That's enough. And be skeptical about links and attachments. Do not open them. 
if, if you're at all skeptical, they're the way that your system gets infected. Put the OS updates immediately. If people had done that with, um, sorry, uh, uh, with uh, WannaCry, it, it, uh, they wouldn't have been infected. It keep the internet security and antivirus databases current as well, and you need antivirus. Oddly enough, the best one I believe is Kaspersky, which is of course headquartered in Moscow. <laughs> so, um, and I can't read what the last one is because it's on the bottom of the screen. Oh, a lockdown remote access software. A lot of these systems, the water, the Florida water attack, which I didn't talk about, but was only because somebody got access to the remote access system, whether it's log me in or one of those types of systems, they get access, all of a sudden they're in. Okay, they're in just as an employee would be in, but they may be across the planet. That's how that system got attacked. So, and don't use public Wi-Fi and Starbucks to do anything that has to do with anything important. Okay, because that is just a wonderful spot for you to get your security credentials stolen. I said I was going to talk about AI. I'm going to just quickly talk about it. AI is the, the best examples of AI today. And I gave a talk on this in 2018 to uh, the library um, is games playing, okay? Because it's a limited framework. AI can't think about everything, but it can really concentrate on a thing like a game. This is the Chinese game Go, which was essentially this uh, company uh, created a game for playing Go uh, meeting against Lee Sigal, who is the number one Go player in China, cleaned his clock, cleans every clock. Essentially, it, this is an incredibly complicated game, but the artificial intelligence system, machine learning, deep learning system, learned how to play it, started playing against itself. In other words, it would create a game and then try to win a game that it created itself and in the process learning. It's a machine learning system. It keeps learning every time it's executed. In many ways, what we're talking about here is the same thing. We've got offense and defense. We've got some rules. You got, can't get outside the computer system unless you know how to do this. You've got strategies and patterns and moves that you can have in a game. And you have strategies, patterns that can be recognized in cyber attacks. So you're going to see that a lot of the cybersecurity vendors now are going to be talking about deep learning and machine learning in particular on their defensive systems because those defensive systems can essentially create an environment um, that's based upon patterns. And if it keeps seeing a pattern and now there's a little change to that pattern, it might say, well, that looks an awful lot like the pattern I saw in this attack. So I'm going to essentially not allow those particular uh, transmissions to go through on, onto our network. So more and more, we're going to see not AI used in a aggressive manner, but in fact, in a much more defensive manner. And that's going to, I think, really take a big change in the balance between offense and defense that exists today, um, because it is much more, it's much easier to create offensive weapons than it is to create defensives to, against them. AI is going to be a tool that will allow us to, to do that. And in fact, it can create these types of systems that can attack themselves and then learn from their attacks by essentially randomizing at an incredibly high speed what the system might be looking at uh, in an attack. So these are all pieces of good news against the bad news that I told you. You have to be alert. It's going, you're going to hear about horrible stories, <laughs> but there is light at the end of the tunnel, I hope. Uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention. I am definitely over my time limit. Um, and uh, I'm just going to say, if we have time for q and I'm, I'm available because I'm home. <laughs> so Courtney, take it over. Thank you so much, John. Fascinating. Uh, we have a few questions. Let's see. Um, the first question has to do with digital currencies. Um, someone wondered if the market for zero-day exploits is facilitated by digital currencies. Uh, well, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, because they know that there's no traceability on digital currencies, uh, Bitcoin being obviously the most well-known. So um, 
I'll, I'll just tell you, it, it, it's a, uh, I can remember the story when, uh, which one was it? Uh, I'm not gonna get it, okay. Um, it, it, the, yeah, so, so definitely all of this is facilitated by Bitcoin primarily. And, and the reason for that is, is that everybody has access to it. Uh, and uh, it's being increasingly recognized by banks, by you know, grocery stores, et cetera. So it is, it is become a real thing. I mean, five years ago, that wasn't the case, but now it is. Um, the thing that worries me the most, I mean, there have been examples of massive extractions of money from, um, uh, from coin exchanges, from the Bitcoin exchanges, where the hackers have gotten into the exchange and essentially empty your wallet, if you will, and uh, keep the money and there's no traceability for that. So uh, being a geek, I have looked many a time at should I put some money in Bitcoin or shouldn't I? And I keep on coming down to I shouldn't because every, at the end of the day, it is a software system. And for the most part, I have, you know, this one hasn't been cracked yet, but you got an awful lot of people out there that would like to crack it because if they crack it, they could make a real lot of money. So I decided that's not for me yet. So there's two ways I'm answering the question. One is, yes, it's facilitating. Bitcoin does facilitate the movement of money because of its uh, anonymity. Um, but the other side of it is I wouldn't, uh, I don't, I'm waiting for waking up one morning and hear that Bitcoin has been beaten, that the algorithm has been beaten. So we'll see how that works. Thank you. Um, I think you answered this a little bit, but bears repeating. When you're noted, when you are, get a notification about an upgrade for your computer or phone, how do you know if it's legit and not a phishing expedition? Um, it's a good question. Um, in, in many ways, uh, I, for example, don't wait to be notified. <laughs> I just will look almost matter of course daily uh, at Windows Update and uh, my iOS, you know, see if there's any software updates. Apple does a much better job on this too. I mean, their notification is pretty solid. A a Apple is really in uh, doing a great job on producing operating systems and software that, that is pretty much invulnerable to a lot of this stuff. Microsoft is still got issues because it came from a base that was <laughs> MS-DOS when it's down to, and there's lots of holes there. So, but in any case, so I look to see, are there any updates? And if there are, I'm at the, I'm on their website. Okay. And if, uh, you have to trust something, you end up trusting the browser in this case. And if you're on the website and you see Windows Update and um, download it, it's uh, if it's there. And so I make that kind of a, uh, a regular event. Um, same thing with my phones and iPad, et cetera. Can't hear me. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> along the same lines, um, do you have any recommendations for a trusted password manager? Um, it's funny. Um, uh, yeah, I use RoboKiller, uh, not RoboKiller, I use that too, uh, for, for not getting weird phone calls, which you might want to check out too on your, on your phones. Uh, very good product, I think, but um, um, <laughs> I use it every day and I forgot what its name is. It's Robo Forb, I think it is. Um, and it, it's not, it, the thing is, it's almost... Password managers are, if you haven't got one, you're, you're really in good shape because you can get a new one. <laughs> but password managers are like your, your uh, you know, uh, payment vendors and your banking system. One of the reasons we're at Bank of America is not because I really love Bank of America, but because all the auto pays and everything are there. So it would be a colossal pain in the butt to transfer those over to another bank. Uh, so therefore, we stay with Bank of America. Same thing with password managers. I got all my passwords for each one of the vendor, you know, each one of the sites that I go to, 
Uh, there's no easy way to move the, intentionally. There's no easy way to move those over to another password manager. So I stay with the one I've got. Kaspersky, again, I like, they're technically very astute despite the fact they're Russian, um, which are always very technically astute as it turns out. But, um, but they have a, a good password manager. One password, I believe, the number one with password after it is the uh, best-selling password manager. So uh, yeah, uh, the other thing, I mean, uh, again, on passwords, um, I do things like um, I'll have, uh, I'll, I'll take a letter of the, of the company like Microsoft and I'll say, I'll use the fourth letter of, of the vendor, uh, of, the, of the site that I'm going to as part in some part of the password, like the third character. So I'll have a password that you know is something that I'll remember, but it will change depending on what that letter is, right? So by definition, I've got 26, maybe 36 with the zero to nine different passwords that I can remember the outside and the inside, but that number in the middle, I don't know. But that means if it, one of them gets hacked, I've still got 25 others that haven't been hacked. Mm -hmm. And so, doing that kind of a scheme with your password so you have multiple passwords but still don't drive yourself yourself nuts about which password did i use with which system mm -hmm. uh that kind of thing can can work it, can it be hacked sure will they bother i don't think so thank you um um someone is asking who's the best hacker you've heard of and is he or she a white hat or a black hat <laughs> <laughs> most of the best hackers are black hats <laughs> because those are the ones you hear about um the white hats you don't hear that much about i mean a lot of reasons for that they don't want to advertise um the companies that they're working for don't want them identified <laughs> whereas the black hats is like the guy with the lamborghini he gets all his jollies out of you know being a hacker and living the hacker lifestyle, uh, living on the edge. So I, the Russian guy that I identified, he's he's probably one of the best. It's in the slides, but um, um, but uh, it's it's a tra you know it it changes. <laughs> depending on what to where we're at with which system, you know, which, which, what's the latest um, exploit that's been used. And if that thing is really cool, then maybe that guy gets the award. But you've got, again, on this AI thing, and, um, since I wanted to talk a little more about AI, but I can't. <clears throat> um, there was, back in 2016, there was at one of the cyber one of the uh, cybersecurity con conferences was or hacker conferences in this case. Um, they essentially put up eight machines and eight teams. And what the idea was here is that those eight teams were going to write software based on AI to both attack the other seven machines and defend itself against attacks from the other seven machines. So each one of those machines was programmed to defend itself from attacks from seven different machines that had been coded by seven different teams. And each one of them wrote routines to offensively attack the other machines. Um, and so at the end, how many were standing? One. <laughs> so whoever wrote that code, that's, that was, in other words, there was nobody running. They all it did was sit there and run. I mean, it was the, it was one of the dullest. Uh, it was on stage, and they had these eight machines, and the eight machines. There's not even going to be lights on them. They're just boxes, and they're fighting each other. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're, they're they're in incredible combat, and all the developers are nowhere to be found. I mean, they're uh, completely separate. So this was quite a. Uh, a way of getting optimal capabilities for defense and offense on cyber attacks. So you let the machine figure it out with machine learning of what those offensive and defensive techniques were. And the guy that won was the guy that had the best techniques. He survived. So 
And sorry, there were all guys. <laughs> but that was 2016. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. <this> is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a couple more questions. Um, one is asking about your views on Edward Snowden, if you'd like to share. <laughs> <laughs> How I get in trouble. <laughs> I, I am thoroughly mixed on it. Um, I mean, he leaked a lot of stuff that was very disastrous for security. I mean, potentially, you know, the names of operatives that are in other countries, and et cetera. That's unacceptable. What he did in regards to the NSA, I think was was very good. I think the people we are we should know if our government is essentially creating software that potentially they can they can um, look at us, let alone others, uh, and uh, you know creating software that puts our businesses like Microsoft and Apple at disadvantage because they know that there's a fix that needs to be made, but they're not telling them. And that opens up the door for a lot of people like you and me having a lot of problems. So I don't agree with that. And I think, you know, I like the fact that Snowden exposed it. I don't think he had any conscious idea that this, that those documents were going to be, at least what I thought were really, really important documents compared to, I think he was very upset about the telephone story. That was, I think his main reason, but, but in any case, so I, I'm thoroughly mixed uh, on one hand, um, glad he's not here on the other hand, uh, I, I'm glad that some of that stuff actually came to light. Thank you. And the last question that I have in the chat is, we frequently accuse China, Russia, North Korea of state-sponsored hacking programs, but here in the US, we have privatized that function to Google, Facebook, Microsoft, et cetera. Your thoughts on state-sponsored versus privatized hacking? Um, I don't see privatized hacking. Um, uh, I mean, that's what I think companies like Microsoft do is they have large teams that are uh, trying to break their system so that they can find ex exploits themselves. The um, um, If you're talking about those companies, I, I don't, I'm not sure what you're getting at or what you're basing it on. If you're talking about Facebook, <laughs> that's a different story. Um, they're, to me, really a a uh, fairly disgusting organization, in my opinion. <laughs> of course, I put up this particular uh, speech that I'm giving on Facebook today. <laughs> uh, but what they did with Russia, their lies, continual lying about it, uh, continually dodging uh, investigation, um, and uh, so I, they, they are. What Russia did it was a cyber attack. Okay, they did it. It's a psychological cyber attack. They essentially flooded, uh, you know, social media with uh, false IDs, false claims. They're doing it with the vaccines. I mean, and where is it? It's on Facebook. It's. I mean, less on Twitter. They were very late to come to the idea that they were going to restrict Trump. Uh, and uh, so, no, I, so they are complicit in a cyber attack to me. Uh, I don't see that with uh, Microsoft and Apple, et cetera. So to me, it's different. Okay. There, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> That's the last of our questions in the chat. If anyone has one that they'd like to speak aloud, feel free to unmute. I don't have a question, but thank you, John. As always, fascinating. Um, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak to all of us. Well, thank you very much. I, as you can probably tell, I enjoy talking about this stuff. <laughs> maybe, maybe to a fault. Uh, <laughs> 
but uh, but it is fascinating, and I hope it uh, I hope it was educational uh, to you, and and somewhat maybe even somewhat comforting <laughs> that it's maybe not as bad as it seems, although it's pretty bad. <laughs> but thanks. So, John, a question for you. <clears throat> um, the um, the automated channels for updates, the Microsoft automatic updates, the Apple automatic updates, Ubuntu, are, do you consider those to be trusted channels or uh, not? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, with the knowledge these companies have of, of, of what has gone on in the past and what's going on right now, uh, as opposed to solar winds, <laughs> I mean, this is interesting. Uh, um, if you remember the solar winds, the guy who was in charge of the updates was essentially the guy that had the password of solar winds one two three. Um, the operating system vendors uh, are, I believe, incredibly conscious of update hacks or what are called supply chain hacks, and so yeah, their automatic update is the best of all because it's automatic. So I would say, yes, I do trust them and I would use it, I do. So. Thanks, excellent talk, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Any more questions? Okay, I want you all to know that based upon you watching this, I have infected all your machines. <laughs> <laughs> there, will be a, there will be a ransomware uh, attack. Uh, Let's see. Is this a reverse attack where you're going to send us all Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. But we know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Hey, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I wish we could have done it personally, and uh, but I hope you learned something, and, and I look forward to meeting you. Uh, and have a great night. And thank you very much, Courtney and Steve, for uh, for uh, having this. It's a great, great thing. Thank you right. so much. All right, guys. Have care. a good night. You too. Thank you, John. Thank you, Corey. Thank you.